Let us turn our attention now and shine the spotlight on the investment banks and the role they play in the whole acquisition process. Because I'm afraid to say, speaking as a former investment banker, uh, the um, institutions themselves are far from blameless in this situation. There are a number of issues which need to be addressed here to make sure that investment banks get their share of the credit for poor acquisitions. We shall again turn to Mr Buffett and Mr Munger to allow them to explain. So that you can see this is not just a, a rant coming from me. And these factors are presented in no particular order, but serve to highlight what happens when you detach reality from deal structuring and negotiation. Investment banks typically manage M&A deals through an auction process, as explained here by Mr Buffett. Quote, at other companies, other than Berkshire Hathaway, executives may devote themselves to pursuing acquisition possibilities with investment bankers, utilising an auction process that has become standardised. So most deals come to the market through some form of auction process, which of course is an aim to get the best possible price for the seller, which doesn't always mean you get a good deal for the buyer or for their shareholders. Now, the first comment um, I'd like to share with you is on investment bank presentations. And this story is told by Warren Buffett in respect of a company, Scott Fetzer, which they subsequently acquired, Berkshire Hathaway acquired this company. So in 1985, and I'm quoting, a major investment banking house undertook to sell Scott Fetzer, offering it widely, but with no success. Upon reading of this strikeout, I wrote to Ralph Shea, then and now Scott Fetzer's CEO, expressing an interest in buying the business. I had never met Ralph, but within a week we had a deal. Unfortunately, he continues, Scott Fetzer's letter of engagement with the banking firm provided it a $2.5 million fee upon sale, even if it had nothing to do with finding the buyer. And I might add, that is a perfectly usual mandate condition. Uh, it's designed there primarily to uh, stop the um, the firm finding a buyer from somewhere else after the investment banks all, have done all the work. And it's not an unreasonable uh, clause, but it does seem to be particularly rich here, obviously. He says, I guess the lead banker felt he should do something for his payment. So he graciously offered us a copy of the book on Scott Fetzer that his firm had prepared. Here's the punchline. With his customary tact, Charlie responded, I'll pay $2.5 million not to read it. So that tells you something about their attitude and approach to investment banks. Warren also dryly comments, what's particularly entertaining in these books is the precision with which earnings are projected for many years ahead. If you ask the author banker, however, what his own firm will earn next month, he will go into a protective crouch and tell you that business and markets are far too uncertain for him to venture a forecast. I could not resist adding this quotation. We expect all of our businesses to now and then have ups and downs. Only in the sales presentations of investment banks do earnings move ever upward. Buffett and Munger are not fans of EBITDA or EBITD either. Let me share their advice with you. Our advice, whenever an investment banker starts talking about EBITD, or whenever someone creates a capital structure that does not allow all interest, both payable and accrued, to be comfortably met out of current cash flow, net of ample capital expenditures, zip up your wallet. And that's a very good dig at the leverage buyouts, which I'm discussing in this section. This is what the Berkshire Hathaway School thinks the role of investment bankers really should be. But Charlie and I, in our hopelessly old fashioned way, believe that they should perform a gatekeeping role, guarding investors against the promoter's propensity to indulge in excess. As you can see, he continues to warm to the theme. Promoters, after all, have throughout time exercised the same judgment and restraint in accepting money that alcoholics have exercised in accepting liquor. At a minimum, therefore, the banker's conduct should rise to that of a responsible bartender who, when necessary, refuses the profit from the next drink to avoid sending a drunk out on the highway. His conclusion, however, is fairly damning. In recent years, unfortunately, 
many leading investment firms have found bartender morality to be an intolerably restrictive standard. Lately, those who have travelled the high road in Wall Street have not encountered heavy traffic. One of the consequences of this behaviour, which feeds into poor deal-making and unsuccessful acquisitions, are bubble markets. In 2000, and this was just as the dot-com bubble had exploded, Buffett made these comments. What actually occurs in these cases is wealth transfer, often on a massive scale. By shamelessly merchandising birdless bushes, promoters have in recent years moved billions of dollars from the pockets of the public to their own purses and to those of their friends and associates. And I'm quoting this in full. The fact that a bubble market has allowed the creation of bubble companies, entities designed more with an eye to making money off investors than for them, too often, an IPO, not profits, was the primary goal of a company's promoters. At bottom, the business model for these companies has been the old-fashioned chain letter, for which many fee-hungry investment bankers acted as eager postmen. But a pin lies in wait for every bubble. As somebody once said, if, uh, if something can't go on, it eventually won't. And when the two eventually meet, a new wave of investors learn some very old lessons. Firstly, Many in Wall Street, a community in which quality control is not prized, will sell investors anything they will buy. Second, speculation is most dangerous when it looks easiest. So Buffett, as he reminds you himself, does not have a perfect record in making acquisitions, although we're going to look cl more closely at his criteria and track record in the next section of the course. He says, even so, we make many mistakes. I am the fellow, remember, who thought he understood the future economics of trading stamps, textiles, sh textiles shoes and second-tier department stores. Part of the problem created by investment banks is magnified, as we've already seen by the approach taken by CEOs to acquisition opportunities. Acquisition proposals remain a particularly vexing problem for board members, Buffett says. The legal orchestration for making deals has been refined and expanded, a word aptly describing attendant costs as well. But I have yet to see a CEO who craves an acquisition bring in an informed and articulate critic to argue against it. And yes, include me among the guilty. On this issue, he continues, Overall, the deck is stacked in favour of the deal that's coveted by the CEO and his her obliging staff. It would be an interesting exercise for a company to hire two expert acquisition advisors, one pro, one con, to deliver his or her views on a proposed deal to the board, with the winning advisor to receive, say, ten times a token sum paid to the loser. Don't hold your breath awaiting this reform. The current system, and this is the key point, whatever its shortcomings for shareholders, works magnificently for CEOs and many advisors and other professionals who feast on deals. His final piece of advice regarding investment banks. A venerable caution will forever be true when advice from Wall Street is contemplated. Don't ask the barber whether you need a haircut. So when considering where, why acquisitions fail, it is instructive to be critical of the way the market for M&A deals operates and the incentives and motivations of the players involved. When presented with a reason for why something happened, keep asking why again and again to peel back the layers of the onion and to understand the second, third and deeper levels of the problem. So that's a slightly expanded explanation and discussion of the role of investment banks. Uh, they are far from blameless in this process, uh, although they will literally heap the blame on the companies who make the acquisitions when they don't work out. But you should go into this with your eyes open and be prepared to observe and then critique what you see.